Well, we're going to continue in the Acts, book of Acts. We're on a five-year journey <laughs> through the book of Acts. Kidding, hopefully three years. Um, and when we, I, so we're going to be covering like the end of chapter six and all of seven today. So we're going to move pretty fast through this. Um, but I, when I contemplate and think about things of, about faith, especially in our context, um, it's, it's fairly easy. And, um, I guess my question is, is like, when we look around, not only in the church, but, and, and, you know, for our point students, would you guys, you know, when you guys look around, what do you see? What do you see when you look around? Broken world. It's a good thing. You know, we are a church full, we are a church of, of Christian people. So when I look around and see people, that's what I see, right? Like Christians, right? Look at Point University and I see Christians, right? That's what we're labeled as. And then I think about like, I wonder what people see, how people see me, right? Do I come off as a Christian? Do I come off as a, you know, a follower of Christ? And I think a follow-up, is it, is it easy for us to be described as Christians? Is it easy for us to, to, be, to be described as Christians? I think generally, yes. Right, we always, you know, if you claim Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're like, yeah, I'm, that, that person's a Christian. If you have changed behaviors in your life, yeah, that, you know, that person's a Christian, right? But why? Why is that? Just because we, you know, do, do we dress the part? Do we look a certain way? Do we listen to certain music? Abstain from certain activities? And when we look around and see things like that, you know, we're here on a Sunday morning, right? We carry ourselves with a, a certain morality, right? We know these songs that are playing, right? You turn on the radio, a Christian station, you hear those songs and we know them, right? Not everybody grew up that way, though. And we know as a Christian that God loves us. But there's, there's more to it than that. There's more to it than a Sunday morning. There's more to it than dressing a certain way, you know, in your Sunday's best or whatever. I would, I would dare say that most people here today claim themselves as Christians. However, they struggle in a tension that lies in the faith. Of Christianity. Most struggle with letting go of their old ways, right, to become more like Jesus. It's tough. Letting go of ourself, how we've identified for however many years, if, you know, I came to Christ at 29, I had... 28 years of bad behavior, right? And letting that stuff go is hard and was hard. And I still deal with some of that stuff today. And some of my old behaviors come back into play. Even though it's tough, there's a necessity when we try to pursue relentlessly the love of Christ, right? And we have to do that with haste. We have to pursue Christ with haste. When we look around, do we see that happening in people's lives? Do you see that happening in the lives of our spouses or in our kids and our communities, right? It's not like that in my own life all the time. I can admit that. And I ask for forgiveness right now of that. I'm not the greatest example, and I can admit it. Discipleship, being an apprentice of Jesus Christ, is not easy. 
It's, it's strenuous, it's demanding, it's time consuming, right? But it's amazing, it's joyful. Most importantly, it's costly. It's very costly, regardless of where you're at in your journey, in your faith walk. Discipleship is costly. So we're going to be talking about Stephen today. How many of us know who Stephen is, right? You heard a, a little bit about him last week. Stephen came to faith, and his faith is quickly tested. And I wonder often what it's like to be tested. And... Um, and the reason is, is because we are in an environment that our faith doesn't get as tested as other parts of the world, right? We're not used to pressure, you know. We, I, I've met some people that have done some missionary work um, over the years uh, in very hard countries where they've had to hide underground and stuff like that. And sometimes I look at my life and I reflect and I, I think... I take advantage of God and what he provides for me. And I can say that openly. I think there are times where I take advantage of what he's provided for me, and I don't take it seriously enough. We, as a Western church here in America, have it relatively easy. We are lucky to be here. All of us, right? Some of, it, some of us might have it better than others, yeah? Some of us might work a job that pays very well. Some of us be, might be struggling to work three jobs to just pay the bills. Some of us may not, have, may not have employment at all. But overall, we have it better globally speaking than most do. We see this veil removed, Right, especially when we're under pressure, we see the, see the real certainty and uncertainty of humanity when, there's, when we're under pressure. Stephen was put into leadership fairly quickly. Don explained that some uh, explained some of who we are uh, as refuge last week. You know what is eldership and and whatnot, and I'm so grateful for that. Stephen was an, uh, an elder to say the least. He showed skill, he showed devotion, he show, showed loyalty, dependence on God, and his faith was mo uh, moving and extremely noticeable. There was something about Stephen that stood out, and that's what, why he was chosen. So as we read Acts 6, verse 8 through 15, I want, and uh, that's where I'll start. It says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue and the, uh, sorry, synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the uh, Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and those of uh, Sicilia, or Sil Sicilia, yeah, in Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly in, 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 instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the, uh, up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set false witnesses who said, and they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So it goes on. Stephen goes on, and the people, the, the councilmen, the, the leaders of the church were like, hey, are these claims true, 
right? That's what he says. This starts out in Acts 7. I'm not going to read all of Acts 7. I'll let you guys do that on your own because it's a lot, and I've already been uh, complimented on how well I can read, and that's not very well. Um, but I'm going to give a, a breakdown of it. So Acts 7 showcases Stephen's boldness in these moments, proclaiming God's truth dis- despite knowing it could lead to his death. He brings up all this dialogue, and he, and he goes through the history. It serves, what it's doing, it's serving as a stark reminder of the, co- of the cost of discipleship. And, he said, and Stephen's steadfast faith, his vision of Jesus in his final moments and his Christ-likeness to forgive towards his killers combine uh, to form a deeply moving testimony of unwavering, unwavering uh, commitment to the gospel. So verses 1, Acts of verse 1 uh, through 53 of Acts 7 is his defense and is and, and against what the religious leaders are holding him to. And they asked if the charges against him are true, right? And Stephen goes into this very eloquent and, and thorough, thorough, super thorough recounting of all of Israel's history. And he begins with God's call to Abraham. And then he goes into Joseph, covers Joseph's rise of power in Egypt. And then he goes into emphasizing Moses' leadership during the Exodus. And then he's in, into the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. He also speaks of David and Solomon and the building of the temple. It's a really long summary. Stephen then accuses his accusers of being stiff-necked people and resistant to the Holy Spirit, just like their ancestors. That was the whole premise of it. And he charges them with betraying and murdering the righteous one, Jesus Christ. That's the general summary of what is happening here. And then in verse 54, it says, now when they heard them, they being the councilmen, the religious leaders, right? Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they found uh, and they ground their teeth at him. That I mean, if, if you're ever that mad at somebody, you know you're mad, right? Who's been that mad at somebody? Definitely, right? But he, this is Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped, and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they asked and, and as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And fallen to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said, his, uh, and when he said, and when he had said this, he fell asleep. For me, when I'm reading this, there's a lot to process, but the immediate, my immediate thought goes back to Acts 5 when we re- read about Gamaliel. And he's giving them warning to let things be, right? The religious leaders would not let things be. Gamaliel says, hey, he held them to a standard and he said, hey, if, if what they're doing, this movement is from man, it's going to go away, Right? It's going to go away, no matter what. We have proof of history of this. However, if it's from God, you're not going to deter it. It will always play out. And there is history of that, and that's why he's bringing it. If it's from God, you'll never stop it. And I've seen evidence of of, of this exact same thing in people's lives. We fight so hard to stop things in our lives from happening, but yet they seem to move forward anyways. 
Sometimes we see things and we just want to keep going. And it's a constant battle, right, of, of getting this thing to go forward. And we're always hit with walls and like it shouldn't happen. But yeah, it's from man, it's going to end, right? But if it's from God, the harder we fight against it, the more <laughs> it's going to come to fruition at some point. And I know and understand that following Christ isn't easy. We're going to have roadblocks. We're going to have barriers in our way, right? It won't come easy, but there are times that we're facing something that when we're facing something that we have initiated, it can be hard, right? And there's a lot of confusion to us. A lot of times when we're facing things that are hard, we think of it as a misfortune. And yeah, there are times where our behaviors have contributed to that misfortune, right? Our actions. But when we get, up, get upset about things that, that aren't, when we are upset about some things that we feel they should be going a different way, right? We lash out at others. My life should be going this way. I shouldn't have, shouldn't have uh, gotten this speeding ticket. Well, what were you doing to get a speeding ticket? Probably speeding, right? We lash out at others. We start playing the blame game, pointing fingers. Well, my, div my, uh, my marriage didn't work well because, you know, my spouse. You know, my job didn't work well because of my employer, right? My best friend just left me, right, because he didn't agree with what I was doing. We have all this stuff. My kids won't talk with me because of blah, blah, blah. There's, there's things that we have done in our life that we have to take ownership for, for. Again, if it's from man, it's going to fail. We will fail. If we are under the authority, the obedience, and the sovereignty of God, and we accept that His will will play out in our lives, well, guess what? It's going to play out regardless. So as we are working through the, the history of this church, of the first church, um, the highest, they, we get to experience the highest of the highs, right? They have the descent of the Holy Spirit upon them. They, we see growth in their church right away. And then we also see the very lowest of the lows. We see persecution, right? We see uh, martyrdom. Martyrdom. The first disciples, um, or some of the disciples, are arrested right away. And we see that in Acts 4. Two chapters after that, Spirit comes and he and he, they fill and he fills the believers up, right? The disciples continue to be faithful to Jesus regardless and live their way, live out their lives through faith. And they make a lot, a lot of enemies. In five, uh, in Acts 5, th verse 33, um, those listening to the disciples, become angry and want to kill them. And that finally plays out here with Stephen's arrest. Again, he gives them this memorable, long and exhausting, eloquent and very thorough sermon. But the response of the hearers is anger, lashing out, killing him. We read about Stephen being stoned to death, becoming this first martyr of the known martyr, I had to say that, first mo known martyr of the church. See, the thing that we don't get to experience that they did is as their church grew, they experienced more persecution, more persecution, more persecution. Again, we have it easy here in America. Comparatively speaking, this tension between God's plan for the redemption of, of his people and our own uh, 
plans bent towards destruction and our own self-serving is uh, is the natural course of things. We're going to we are going to go against God at points in our lives because we don't want to hear what He has to say. We're going to go against God when we don't feel that this is not this was not supposed to happen in my life. Right? That happens often. Jesus says this in um, the Gospel of John, in John 3, verses 19 through 20. He talks about the world of light and the world of darkness and says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people loved, dark, loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. It's easy to forget. It's easy to, for us to forget that. It's easy for us to go back to our own ways and fall into this very, um, our old behaviors essentially, not, not having a changed heart, right? Continue down the path of people pleasing and, and, and wanting to be liked. That's the easy path. Paul says it in Galatians 1.10, says, I am now seeking the approval of man, or am I now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would, never be a ser- I would not be a servant of Christ. That's a tough one to read, because there are so many times where I just want to be a, a servant of man, not a servant of God. I want to be liked. I want to have some authority in my community, right? I want to have the influence. Brad and I have had multiple conversations about that, my heart in that, you know, wondering why people aren't here on a Sunday morning or whatever it is. And it's like, man, my day's ruined because I didn't see this person at church. That's the wrong heart. When it comes to to following Jesus in this world, we should expect opposition, first and foremost. We have to put boundaries up in our life in order to follow God, God's plan for our lives. If we don't want to revert back to old ways, that's what we should be doing. And there's going to be trouble along the way. And there's going to be hardship along the way. But as Jesus has said, we're not to lose our hope and our faith, but rather keep focused on Jesus and his ultimate victory. Stephen, we look at his death, and he is demonstrated, demonstrating what it looks like to be faithful to the very end. He is using his trial as a moment to share the gospel. And he, and he dies for it. And when he looks up into heaven and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and he's like, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That's what he says in verse 59. Tim Keller said, Stephen seemed to be the first Christian leader to grasp the gospel, to, uh, to grasp that the gospel has a radical missionary energy to it. He, re- he realized that the gospel of Jesus means that God's presence, presence is not tied to one's land or people. Even faced with death, Stephen plays it out to the very end. He is faithful. He continues to share the gospel to others. It's inspiring. When we look at the first church, it just reminds me we are called to remain faithful, no matter what, even to the very end. Right? So when I think about all of this, I I used that term persecution earlier. I don't think we, 
I don't think we understand the term persecution here as it was back then or even in different countries today um, in our way because in, in the American context because we do have it fairly easy here. We have it, you know, we're going to have disagreements with people. You know, people aren't going to like what we have to say. People are going to try to want to shut us down and yet we want to raise our hands and be like, oh, I'm being persecuted, right? There is, I get what's being said, but you're, you're not going to die for it, more than likely. Um, if you do, we'll be there. God, that would be awful. <laughs> if we suffer criticism in our lives, we get super defensive, right? We get super defensive if we face criticism in our lives. What we should do in those moments is surround ourselves by people that we are trusted with, right? Man, criticism is okay, people. It's a necessary part of life. If there's something that you're doing wrong and you have a trusted group of friends around you to tell you, hey, knock it off, they're speaking truth into your life. Yes? It's not always great to hear either. It's not. But once we can come to the realization like, man, this behavior that I'm doing this probably isn't the correct way to live my life as if I call myself a Christian, right? We can allow people to speak hard truths into our lives, right? If your attitude's bad, accept it. Work through it. Put some stuff in your life that's, you know, some practices to help us recognize a bad, you know, bad attitude, Believers, as we call ourselves, believers, we're going to face opposition. But we can't avoid the accountability of our own actions in those moments. We have to be accountable for what we do and how we respond to people. We have to be, do it with a humbling attitude. We have to remember that the ultimate goal is not us. The ultimate goal is to point people towards Christ's kingdom, right? So as I think about Stephen's life that we get to experience in the Bible and what he is calling out towards the religious leaders, there's five things that I think we can learn from his life that's being exposed here. And the first one is that there's commitment to service commitment to service. Our desire here at Refuge is that is to be a place characterized, bless you, by service. Sir, we like to serve our community. And I think we do that fairly well. Can we do better? Absolutely. Always. There's always room for improvement. But what serving our community looks like is it allows us to not only connect with people, but to care for people, right? That allows us to start a conversation. You know, why are you guys cutting my grass? Well, because we care for you, right? Why are you guys cleaning up the streets? Because we care for you. We care for our community. It allows an open door for conversation to begin. We should all make room in our lives to do things we aren't necessarily thrilled to do. Do I like to serve my community? Not all the time, right? There's times where I don't have enough time, but I have to make room. There's I've had beat people call me some bad names in this community, and I'm fine with that. It's not always easy, right? But if we want to maintain that, that role of, of servanthood, that attitude of servanthood, we have to be committed to service. 
nothing is below us. The second thing is, is that nothing is more important than the Word of God. Nothing is more important than the Word of God. As I preach on a Sunday morning, everything that I speak can be found in the Bible. Right? All the scripture that I use is out of the Bible. It's ESV or NIV version. I do have my own takes on some scripture, but I, I, if I'm wrong, people will tell me. I'm open to criticism in that way. Right? I get to be a pastor of a church, and it's very cool. And I hold the Bible and God's word, right, in authority. I'm not bigger than it at all. I'm indebted to you guys, and I'm very thankful that my primary focus here is to preach and take care of the needs of the church as best as I can. I, you know, I have a lot to do here still, is what I've been told. You know, the back has stuff to do, right, Aaron? <laughs> yes. But when I think about, you know, how I can best use my abilities, you know, holding God's word to the highest, I have to be involved in the word of God. I have to be opening up my Bible multiple times a day, meditating on what it is saying. I think my biggest discrepancy with my, like, coming to faith and, like, when I got in a, in a bind I would quickly search scripture for something that would fit into the narrative of what I was experiencing instead of meditating on God's word. And so when a, when a situation arised, God's word was already there in my mind. I'm not going to the word of God for just some band-aid fix. I'm going for a deeper fix, right? God's word is always there for us. The third, third thing is that God does his greatest work through ordinary people. Stephen was this ordinary dude. I'm an ordinary guy. I don't, I don't think there's anybody extraordinary with some like special gifts that can heal like, like Jesus quality gifts in this room. No? Anybody? You think you're like God-like? Probably not. Right? I'm, we're all ordinary people, yes? Yeah. God can use you. You have to, we have to be willing to step out in that faith, right? And do it. God's saying, hey, I should go pray for this person. Step out and ask them, hey, I think God's leading me to pray for you. Let's do that. Make friends. We're all, we should all be family here, right? The littlest things sometimes have the biggest impact on, on people's lives. The littlest things. Today we think that, you know, these people, the celebrities, all these people have the greatest influence in the world, and that's not the case. We can be used. They're just ordinary people. They're just in a different context than us. We can be used to do some really great work, right? The fourth thing is that Christians are a contradiction to the world. And what I mean is that we should be confusing to people, to the surrounding world, right? Because we need to be speaking grace and truth. That's what we're, we're supposed to do. And you see that in Stephen's life. One minute he's pointing fingers at the religious uh, leaders and calling them heartless murderers. And that's the truth, right? That you guys crucified Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's the truth. You guys are heartless. It gives them that big backstory. And the next moment they're stoning him and he's praying for their forgiveness. That's grace. Sometimes truth is not easy to hear. Grace is sometimes not easy to give as well. 
And sometimes it's sad to say that even if you speak great truth graciously, the world's still going to hate you. People around you are still going to hate you. And the fifth thing is that sometimes God's will for us is martyrdom. Stephen did everything right, everything right, and he ended up dead. What happened? Why didn't God rescue him, right? Honestly, we don't know always why God allows people to suffer. I don't have answers for that. A lot of you currently know what's happening in my life. I don't know why. Things are hap- why things happen the way they do. Only thing I can say is that um, God's sovereignty rules, and I have to be submissive to that. What's going to happen is that I want a God honoring family, right? G- Stephen's most effective contribution to the kingdom of God is his martyrdom. Have you guys known anybody who has been martyred? No. It's very far and few between, right? I was privileged to have met uh, and do life for a short period of time with a guy named uh, Walter Shepard, and his wife was uh, Valerie Elliott uh, Shepard. And her dad was a guy by the name of Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott was a martyr who was... uh, killed by an Ecuadorian tribe in the 70s and along with four other people trying to bring the gospel to them. And I have some pictures of him. Uh, This is him out of uh, seminary school. He went to Wheaton College. Uh, And then the next one is him and Ecuador. They're kind of, you know, not great quality pictures. I don't think they had, <laughs> and it's the wall too. And then this is uh, the, his wife. So Jim Elliott goes to Ecuador, and he's he's meeting with these tribes, right? Meeting with these tribes, trying to spread the gospel. He has some great good success in the very beginning, and then shortly after, they turn, they come to their camp. The Ecuadorian tribe comes to their camp and kills them uh, with spears. Two years after that, he had a daughter. That his daughter was Valerie. Two years after that, Elizabeth, his wife, and their daughter, Valerie, went back to Ecuador and lived with the tribe. She learned that language that Elizabeth did, the wife, learned the language, went back to communicate with them the gospel of Jesus Christ lived with them for two years, and then moved back to the States. I've talked with Valerie, the daughter, and Walter, her husband, at extensive lengths about what it felt like, you know, being a young girl, the stories that her mom would tell her, and all of this. And it was just super impactful, something that a lot of us will never experience in our lifetime. And I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm glad for that, right? I'm very, very thankful that I don't have to have somebody near me experience being killed for the sake of Christ's name. But that story impacted me because, I mean, it connects really well with Stephen's story regardless of what was happening, he carried what Jim carried out to the very end, what he felt God called him to do. Stephen did the same thing. And sometimes that leads to death. So as the band comes forward, I want to have a few last words. When we experience difficult times in our, in our lives, it's easy to fall into this thinking that, that God has forgotten us. Or, it's, or we try to legislate or force the kingdom of God into this world. 
right? But that's not our call. Our call is to follow the example of Christ. We can look at Stephen's life and see that. Our call is to stay faithful to the very end. Using every second to bring glory to God's kingdom. To bring glory to Christ's name. And it's not easy. And we're going to get ridiculed. We're going to get laughed at. We're going to be told that our words are nonsense. And, or how could you believe that? It's easy. Open up our Bibles. Start meditating on God's word more and more. Allow that to play out through our lives. So when we're met with this hesitation, when we're met with this opposition, we have God's word coming out of us. Right? Let our faith, as little as it is sometimes, play out. We have to stand the ground to the very end. If you guys would bow your heads.